There was one time I tried to quit and I told Kong, hey, if I put in my two weeks later on when it's convenient for me, could I come back perhaps? And he told me, he goes, why? And I told him, I said, well, my husband's not willing to keep taking care of the kids all the time because he also works full time. So I think I need to be home a lot more. And he was like, we'll get rid of him. I ended up getting divorced papers, you know, um, served to me at the office one morning in front of all of the interviewees, in front of everybody. And Colm's response was, well, what can you do about it from here? You need to safeguard that shit. for a company called Omni 8 USA, and they're located in San Antonio, Texas. The owner is named Colm Horgan. Yes. Um, this office sells Spectrum, which is internet, cable, TV, uh, phone. But the real reason that I wanted to talk to you was, uh, and you have experience in this, is that they are also an office that is collecting for charities. And in the message that you sent to us, you said the campaign that you were under was for charities for a nonprofit called Plan International or Plan USA. So there, we weren't selling products or signing up for services. You were collecting um, donations with a mission that you said of quote unquote saving kids. Um, and you go to heavy places with heavy foot traffic in downtown um, San Antonio. So um, I've only talked to a few people who have experience in this type of campaign. Can you just kind of tell us a little bit more about your day-to-day -day experiences and, and what you went through collecting money for these charities? So basically a typical work day for me would be um, getting up early. I was an account manager, which is like you start as an account executive, which is basically like barely getting into the office, seeing if you make it to the prom promotion where account manager, you know, recruits people and does all that. So I would go in early in the morning. It would be a meeting about, you know, who's making sales are we meeting our goals whatnot and it'd be like a mix of like spectrum and charity people at the same you know meeting after that we'd go into our own little charity meeting and we'd we never really talked about the children or the the plan international any of that what we talked about was mainly like okay the people that we're recruiting are they making sales do they understand like how to do the pitch do they were they on board with what we were doing and if not we'd cut them loose which was basically like letting them dig themselves in a hole to where we could just fire them off of like oh you're not making sales we don't need you right and then um after that we'd conduct interviews the ones that hit their bell prior uh to that day would go and um, they would take one of the interviewees from the lobby and uh, the way that our interviews would go was mainly like the same type of interview for everybody, whether you were on Spectrum or Charity. The only thing that was different was telling them like, okay, well, your pitch is mainly gonna have to be from the heart, trying to get pull people's heartstrings so that they understand that we're trying to save kids. So people would, uh, the interviewees would mostly be like, oh my God, like we save kids and I'm getting paid for it. Amazing, like let's do this. So we get a lot of people start. After that, um, we would go and do our um, AM like morning meetings upstairs and it would be a uh, morning Atmo. And in Atmo, we would, you know, pitch practice. We would talk about, you know, our strategies, what we're going to do. We would uh, pitch practice towards each other and we would like, because, uh, you know, criticize each other like, okay, awesome. Like, let's work on your aggressiveness. Let's work on your indifference, all of that. And then after that, it would basically, you know, we, they always have like this very inspirational speech, like you're in control of your own destiny. You know, your career is in your hands. It, it all starts with a great attitude. It all starts with, you know, take being a leader, taking that initiative and seeing the bigger picture. After that, we'd all, you know, go with our write outs and they would tell us like which locations we were at. Mainly for me, I was mainly in like downtown San Antonio, where there was heavy foot traffic, you know, the lawyers coming from the courthouse to be people shopping at the San Antonio River Center Mall, all of that. And we, we, <laughs> we had to be there from like 11 to like six o'clock in the afternoon. And 
mainly it was pretty easy if we had heavy foot traffic we know we'd get like from one to three donations a day but it started getting a little trickier whenever police started finding out that we were there they were saying that uh we were um what's the word called that we were just trying to gain money from people and so one of our own um a junior executives actually ended up getting arrested once but Colin Horgan never decided to get us permits so after downtown was kind of like a spot that we couldn't go to we would go and go to the malls go to events like you know the zoo things like that where people are basically thought we were harassing them because it was like hey donate to a kid you know you like kids right why don't you save one you know what I mean right and then um after that, like when the typical workday was done, we'd come back to our PM at Mo, which is what we call it. Um, and and there it was like we talk about our day. Where where did we go wrong? What could we do better um, to reach our goals? How could we help one another? That was basically it. Okay, so you have the two atmospheres, uh, one in the morning, mm -hmm. one in the evening. Okay. Um, do you know, is your company Omni 8, is it, do, are they working for, are they, are, are they a division of, um, Smart Circle, Sidcore, Credico, do you know? Credico and, uh, I think Smart Circle. Okay. Okay. Uh, now you had just mentioned about, um, your owner not getting you permits. Um, was there a specific reason for this? Like, why didn't he at least secure that you would have a safe environment to work in? So only one of us had permit and the permit that he had specifically that he paid for himself, which was a campaign manager, which his name was TJ. Um, he was the one that was in charge of the charity campaign in the office. He was still below uh, Colm. So what TJ had, his type of permit was to ask um, survey questions. So when we would show that to the police, they'd basically laugh at us and they'd say, okay, no, you're still soliciting. Get out of here. You know, mm -hmm. so they would um, the police would take our tablets, they would take our flyers, everything. And they'd say, you know, you can get them back in 30 days if we stop seeing you here. And that's still to call him. He was like, well, I'm not getting your permits unless you pay for them yourselves, because they were like $70 per day. So he didn't want to spend that money or, you know, buy a certain type of permit to where we could, you know, be licensed with downtown to go and do those things. Yeah, I would think like a consistent license wouldn't be that expensive. Like, exactly. No, a lot a of cops even told us go down to the, you know, um, to the courthouse and just explain to them what you're doing. If your charity is actually factual, we will give you a permit. But I think because we weren't, we didn't have anything from the actual charity, we couldn't prove it. So, okay, because I'm a lot of like four questions just entered my mind and I probably won't be able to remember all of them. So let's see how this goes. But the, the first one I, I wondered was, did Colm maybe not want to do the permit or could he not afford to do the permit? Do you, could, did you get this impression that he was actually making money as an owner in this business? He gave off the impression that he'd make money. He was just frugal which is what I noticed that a lot of the junior executives that were basically making twice the commission or they could choose between a 75,000 a year salary or a double the commission uh, if they were to go out on the field. Yet they were very all, they were all just so frugal. You couldn't get fries out of them if you were to not have money yourself. You know what I mean? They were very stingy. They were very like, no, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, Colum himself, he'd he'd buy us drinks when we'd go out, things like that. But when it came to permits and like replacing tablets that were broken, any of that, he put it all on us. Like, no, you have to take care of that. I'm not spending on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And regarding the the city permits, I wonder, do you think there was an element of fear that maybe applying for it would kind of shine a light on this company, which I think so might because that um, was a scam. No, yeah, definitely. Because when it came to the police stopping us and asking us, hey, like, who are you here with? We'd have to say a different name. Sometimes we said we were with the ASP, uh, ASPCS or something like that, rescuing animals, because we didn't want to let them know that we were with the Plan International Charity. Yeah. Huh. 
Did you ever have any contact with the charity itself? No, not at all. We did have a TPV phone call verification line that whenever we make an actual like donation with a, a donor, we had to call the TPV phone line. And what they would do is that we, they would verify like the details we put into the computer, into the tablet. And the funny thing about it, though, is that I remember one time uh, Edwin was the junior executive above me. He was the one who, when I did my interview process, everything, he hired me. So he was the one that was in charge of me and my career, basically. And um, the, during my first few days on charities, because I was Spectrum before, I started on Spectrum and then I got promoted and they were like, hey, you're good at sales. We need more people on the charity squad just to bump up their sales as well. So when I got on, um, Edwin, one time he told me, he goes, okay, so they have to be over 25 to be able to donate. If not, it's considered fraud. And then he told me, because um, I kept letting people that weren't 25 go. He told me, he said, you just missed like three sales because those are the type of people that will donate. He told me, whenever you're on the tablet, he said, like, tablet records us. It records what we say, what we do, what we tell the customers. And um, he told me, put the tablet to your side so it doesn't listen and tell them they were born in 1994 so that they're 25. So we put in all the information on the tablet, everything. And there was times where we wouldn't even ask the donor if they were 25. We would just put 1994 if they were um, younger, they looked young. So that we could, you know, secure the sale because the TPV, they would ask, okay, what's your date of birth? And if they were, you know, 21, they, they couldn't go through, which was weird to me. But um, whenever I made the sale like that, Edwin was quick to turn around and say, okay, well, you just committed fraud. You have to give your donation to this girl that he was dating that was also in the charity squad. He goes, if you don't give her the donation, I will tell Colm that you committed fraud. Mm -hmm. They manipulated the rules. They manipulated everything into like what they wanted on their charity campaign. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It was all about making sales. It wasn't even about uh, saving the kids. In none of our meetings did we ever talk about, oh, hey, we've saved this many kids this month. Great job, guys. Like none of yeah. that. It was like, oh, you didn't make a sale? What the fuck? You know? Yeah, and you've you've mentioned the word sales at least three times since we started talking, and I always I thought it was kind of strange because the first time you said it was when you were talking about your morning meeting, mm -hmm. when I know that you said that they did both the spectrum and the charities at the same time, but did you ever find it kind of strange that they used the word sales when talking about collecting money for charities? Donations. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> They would tell us that the program wasn't about sales. It was more about uh, leadership. But I noticed me and a few of the colleagues that were, you know, not buying the bullshit. We would ask, like, if it's not about sales, then why are we getting reprimanded for not making these so-called sales all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the charity campaign, it was really hard because keep in mind, you're not selling a product. You're not, you, people aren't making, like, they're not getting stocks or anything off of donating to us. And so for us, it was a lot harder to sell the idea of, okay, well, this is like your ticket to heaven, basically, because you're not getting anything from me. All you're doing is, you know, feeling good that you supposedly saved a kid. Now, when we talked on the phone um, recently, you went through the pitch with me. Would you mind um, sharing the pitch with us so we can kind of get an idea of what um, if anyone, and, and this is not just a San Antonio thing. I've done a little research on Reddit and th these charity scams are all over the place. I've seen posts from Atlanta, from Chicago, from Philadelphia. So would you mind kind of going, ob obviously if, if anyone, mm -hmm. if you're ever in a busy area and someone comes up to you and they say, you know, we're collecting money for this. Um, it's, it's going to be a little shady, I would think, but uh, if you wouldn't mind, could you just kind of share some of the pitch and the techniques that people might want to look out for? Yeah, so basically, you know, it, like you said, it's always going to be shady. So what I would do, like, and I'll run it through with you, like facial expressions, like deep emotion, like pausing so you would get the gist of like the point I just made and let it settle in. You know what I mean? Um, there was this thing that we called uh, CPR, which is something that they would dig into. It's like, okay, you have to build more CPR. You have to like make them feel it. It was customer, customer personal relationship. So... <clears throat> 
the way it would work is that throughout my pitch, I'd ask, oh, well, you wouldn't want to go hungry either, right? You know, so I'll just go through it and explain it after. <sighs> Let me get into, like, my scene. <laughs> Yeah, you got to turn into turn back into the robot that you were when you were Yeah, I got to be a whole this. actor again, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like, if I was to see you walking down the street, I'd be like, hey, sir, how are you? I know you're probably super busy at the moment. I'm actually just in the area trying to create awareness for Plan International. You've heard of us, right? No, see, we're actually an international nonprofit. We specialize in helping children in over 70 of the world's poorest countries. I'm sure you're aware of the global poverty crisis at the moment, right? No, see... Over 18,000 children are dying each and every day because they lack basic necessities like clean water, food, shelter, things you couldn't live without, right? See, um, <laughs> what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, what, what would you say that you buy on a day-to-day -day basis? How much would you say you spend? Oh, $30? I'm going to be baller like you, you know? I, I spend like five. But see, with just a dollar a day, you could give these children over three meals a day, clean water, and over time actually help to develop their communities, clean water systems, hospitals, schools, shelters, things that we can say all children deserve, right? <laughs> See, if you were to say no, I'd be a little worried. <laughs> so what I have here today is in my tablet, I have a list of children that desperately need the help. I've been trying to save this one little girl all week. Her family died due to gang activity in her community. And I'd really like to get her, you know, started with some help. Can I show you real quick? And that's when I'd pull out my tablet. I'd show all these pictures of little kids that were just, some of them had like flies in their eyes. Some of them were just, you could tell that they didn't have clothes, none of that. And um, when people would pick them or something, whether it was not the little girl that I mentioned that I knew something about, because we honestly didn't get any information about the children. We didn't get, not a thing, like, we didn't we weren't even taught to remember their names nothing uh as we showed it to the to the donor that's when we knew about it you know what i mean i mean yeah there's so much going on right there um i noticed a lot of questions so mm -hmm. you know anyone who's ever worked in in any of these companies doing anything the pitch is very identical i mean you get a lot of questions like you said you've heard of us right you know wouldn't you agree mm -hmm. right um, that gets them immediately involved in the pitch. Um, mm -hmm. So much emotional appeal, because if you walked up to me and said, you know, that wouldn't you want that for your children? And I'd be like, no, like you said, you know, that would kind of make me sound a little weird. Yeah, I'd be worried, like, geez, let me walk away. <laughs> you know, yeah. we would try to then, joke with the customers so that they'd like, they'd like us. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was all yeah. part of our C factors. Right, exactly. And you used a very common... Um, something I've heard in so many ads for charities here in the United States is something catchy like a dollar a day because mm -hmm. um, and that's I'm sure that's why you asked the question well how much do you spend a day mm -hmm. because no no one has that information offhand no one goes through their day thinking I wonder how much money I spent today you know that's just not something we think of so we just we come up with a random number and that number is always going to be higher than a dollar so when you throw out oh okay well look just for a dollar a day then you can help all these unfortunate individuals. Mm -hmm. So there's an off, like any smart circle pitch, SIDCOR pitch, Credico pitch, it's, it's manipulation, a lot more emotional manipulation than if I was trying to sell you direct TV or whatever else, but there's still manipulation there. And you brought up the photos of the children and you mm -hmm. sent me a couple, uh, a couple images of them too, where you suspected that they were pretty much just the same children. Like they, they, they might were, not have even been real, right? Like they just seemed like they were the same images over and over and over again. And you know how I cut on to that? Um, there was a day that I'll admit that I kind of technically committed fraud. Like it's whatever, you know, um, it was a really bad sales day. I was downtown. It was pouring rain. I think it was like right before the hail hit that night. So, you know, it was windy. It was cold. There was no foot traffic whatsoever. So I called my husband. I said, Hey, I need us to save a kid because I have no sales this week and I'm struggling. So I signed him up, everything. I remembered the kid that we saved. It was this little boy from Honduras. I'm from Honduras. So for me, it was like, okay, I got to save this kid. The week after I saw the same kid again on my list and I was like, that's my kid. That's the kid that I saved. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And 
just over time, I was working there for like four or five months, let me remind you, and every other day I'd see the same kids like, I saved this one yesterday, why is it still on my list, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's when one of the guys that was, that had been there longer than me, he's probably been there a year doing the same thing, still caught up on like bigger dream bullshit. Mm-hmm. He was like, yeah, I think the charity is a real thing, but what we're doing is just throwing money into something else because these are the same kids all the time. You're never going to mm-hmm. see the kid disappear or anything. And in the beginning, when I started asking Colin questions, was like, it's because your customers keep canceling, so the kids come back on the list. You have to make sure that they know, don't cancel. Mm-hmm. You know? Because you wanted repeated donations. You weren't asking for just a one-off yeah. type of thing. No, it was a child sponsorship. It wasn't, oh, hey, can you donate to this kid, please? Like, just $30 right now for the month yeah. could give them all this. No, it was like, oh, please stay for a year so that the kid can get, you know, all this stuff and some people would ask me like oh are you like compassion and what hurt me after a while was that i would literally switch people over from compassion over to this knowing that compassion was an actual charity i have friends that actually donate to compassion and they actually receive an app where they can put in their child's information and get daily updates receive letters all of these things and what we didn't offer and we were still made to you know get them to switch over so hmm. it wasn't really about the kids at all. No. And, and you continued in your message, you, um, kind of going back to what you were just talking about. You said that when um, you got someone to sign up, you promised them that you'd send them a starter kit. You'd send them the child's picture. The, ch- the child would write them once a month. And then you also signed up friends and family, but mm-hmm. no one ever received anything. So do you know if anybody that you signed up that you know of, did they ever receive anything from anybody? No. I would, after a while, I started giving my customers my number and I'd say, hey, like whenever you receive the letter from the little girl, please like text it to me. I want to know how much you're helping her. Okay. Never received anything. I'd even, I'd even text people a month later, like, hey, um, just to make sure that they were still continuing doing the monthly because that's how we got the um, incentives, like $20 the next month. Just to guarantee that I was getting that, I would text him like, hey, how are you? Have you heard from your child yet? So eager to hear how you're helping him out. People would be like, no, I haven't gotten my starter kit. Um, I'm thinking about canceling because I've called three times and never received anything, never heard from them, nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you ever bring those concerns up to Edwin or Paul? I did, but... Um, basically what they would say is that there's, there's people saving kids all over. Like we had charities up in New York, some in Florida, and it was just a hard, like, are we sending them to everybody? You know? Yeah. I would would think though, that if they had said, well, I'm thinking of canceling, if I don't get my stuff, that would have gotten their attention. Yeah. No, you would think that at the call center, they'd be like, okay, let me just put an order out to send this to you real quick. But nope, nobody ever received anything. Um, one thing that since I've learned about this that I've, I've kind of been fascinated about and, and confused about is um, how you all got paid because ideally if someone is donating to a charity you would hope that that money goes to the charity but mm-hmm. this is is kind of a, a hybrid between charitable collections and the whole smart circle sid core credit Co scam of the the pyramid scheme of you know you work a year and you become an owner and you make six figures and you're wealthy and you have all this free time mm-hmm. um you said in your initial message to us that as long as people kept their monthly donation of 35 dollars, mm-hmm. that you would get a residual pay of 20 dollars after their second monthly donation Mm-hmm. But for the first monthly donation, you'd make $80 profit. And you yeah. even said how that works with the charity. You have no idea. You felt like you were stealing money instead of helping the, the children. So do you, even now that you're out of the, the I don't even call it a business, out of the scam, do you, do you know how you got paid and how that money was divvied up between you and the charity and your junior executive and your owner and all that stuff? I don't. Honestly, I don't because um, we would get the 35, right? We would get the $35 donation and we'd make $80 off of that. But if in their next month they did, they canceled or something, Colin would tell us like, well, they canceled, you're not getting your 80. 
or you're not getting your residual and things like that. So sometimes my paycheck was a little off, but I didn't think much of it because I was like, oh, maybe my sales were bad that, bad that month or something. But it was, I don't know, it was like we had to keep them going for a year. And we didn't get $20 every month after. We got $20 after the second month of them, you know, um, sending. So we'd just get that residual of one $20 payment. But it was kind of like to keep us going, to keep us telling them, hey, you know, um, keep keep donating for however long. Sometimes they'd even tell us to tell the people to cancel after four or five months yeah. just so that Colm could still keep getting paid, you know? Yeah, and I, st I still don't know where the money is in this. Like, I don't either, here, because if you think about it, they're giving you 80 for you don't getting them to donate 35. Yeah. If the people only donate two months, that's still 60, 70 bucks, which is less than what they gave us initially, you know? Yeah. So, who knows? So you said earlier, like, if you got, like, three a day, that was a good day right it was a great day yeah no there was days where after i got three i'd be like let me go home but they'd be like no go go out there and get two more go through get three more knowing that it was it was impossible if nobody else was making anything and yeah. i i got lucky there's times where i can sincerely say i got lucky for choosing the right people um sometimes you go off of looks whatever and that's mainly what i did like Usually the younger crowd that was under 25 were the ones that were so eager, like, yeah, let me, let me donate and everything. So now I think that, you know, people that were older, they knew this is a scam. This is not, this is not going towards the kids. Like, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say you did 30, you did three donations of $35 a day. We'll times that by six days a week times four weeks a month. That's just over $2,500 a month. Um, how many other people were working with you on the charity campaign at any so, given time? At one point, we had over a little over nine people. So let's say that all nine people got three a day for six days a week times four weeks a month. That comes out to... 22,000 a month times that by a year. I mean, that's a pretty healthy number right there, but that is an ideal conditions, but still though, that doesn't tell me how nine people um, can make a livable wage. And you, when you have these junior executives, which are supposedly making a, a salary or double commission, which I mean, if you're not, we're, we're using charitable donations. I don't know how you make a double commission off a charitable donation. And then you have Colum, who's supposedly making six figures. He was, Where is this money coming from? Yeah. I don't know. Um, with Colum, even in our interview process, we tell people like, yeah, our boss, he's making over 40 grand a week. <laughs> Just a week. Which, I mean, I'm not sure how true that is because in the end, he... He was wiring $40,000 a week, which later on I found out that that could mean that he's also still has to pay off his, the employees, you know? Yeah. So I was like, he probably has to come out with maybe like two grand, two grand, three grand a week. Because we had a lot of people in the office. There was so many people underneath him. And the way with Edwin, so the reason that they moved me over to charity was because Edwin was kicked off of the Spectrum campaign. Spectrum literally caught on to his his fraud. He would sign up. He would make people disconnect uh, disconnect their Spectrum services, so he could reconnect them again, so he could get paid twice of for course. the same person. Yeah. So they caught on to that. They caught on to the fact that people would call in and like every one of his customers would call back like, "Hey, I want to disconnect it. I want to get a lower price. Everything." And so they kicked him off of that campaign. We started with charities, and it was the same exact thing. It's just that charities, I don't think anybody was really, I don't think it was real. So nobody was really catching on to it. So this Edwin guy, Edwin Gutierrez is his full name. Mm -hmm. um, you told me that he's been a junior executive 
for over a year at Omni 8. First, can you tell me what junior executive is? Is that basically like assistant manager? So you know how pyramids go? You mm -hmm. start at the bottom, you come out as an account manager, uh, account executive. That's just how we label it fancy for our new starts to be like, oh shit, like I'm legit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, from then on, it's account manager, which is where I was, which is where you recruit four people, you move up on the ladder, become a junior executive. Okay. As a junior executive, you had to gather your team of four people, have them, you know, recruit four people, and then make a profit of 10000 within your little group of four. And from there on, that's where you move on to a, a senior executive, yeah. which was the position that Colin was supposedly in, but ob obviously he was a, a, what they would call a promoting executive. Yeah, because he promoted so many people onto where he uh, where he was, which was honestly like maybe three people that he promoted up. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that that pretty much follows the same formula that that I've I've known about. It's just different names for the same exact thing. Um, now you mentioned in your, in your message uh, or in our phone conversation previously uh, talking about Edwin. Um, about being aggressive, and you mentioned that a little bit earlier uh, in our, in this in this interview as well about he how you'd be critiqued about being aggressive, um, but you specifically mentioned about how Edwin was very aggressive when soliciting people. Uh, what were some of the things that he did that made you feel like he was being aggressive? <laughs> when it came to Edwin, he came off as very like, hey, like sometimes he had icebreakers is what we call him for people to like stop what they're doing and listen to us. He tried this a lot with me. He tried to teach me his ways, but they were just, they were just too much of like a jackass for me to try him. It was like women would be walking down the street or something. He'd be like, Hey, you dropped something. And for them to stop and everything, he'd be like, Oh, now that I have got your attention, you like kids, right? Would you like to save a kid? Oh no. Okay. Bye. Like, or sometimes he'd be like, oh, you don't like kids? Wow, like, okay, whatever, you know? So even if you just didn't have the money for it or anything, he just made it seem like, okay, you're a piece of shit. You don't like to save kids, bye. Mm -hmm. Or if he got through the pitch, it would be like, you like kids, right? Cool. So would you ever let your child go without food or water? No. Okay, well, why should these kids go without food or water? Why You can't give a dollar to help them get food, water, shelter? All right, let me sign you up. He literally, he would make it to where they couldn't say no. It was like assume the sale right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Made people feel so guilty to where it was like, I'm a piece of shit if I don't donate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so I, not many of us could adapt those ways at all because it was just too, we weren't in the business of making people feel guilty. For some of us, it was more like, oh, okay, we're saving kids. Like, I'm going to give it my all. But to him, it was like, no, this. I'm going to sell this person without them even knowing. Yeah. Has he ever been punched in the face by anybody? Dude, oh, my God, I wish. <laughs> I would have I would have paid to see that. It sounds like he needs to be, for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. And it was like so many people that would come on. I could, I could give you their numbers and everything. It was people that would come on to Charity Squad. And I remember he made this one older woman cry. And she was like, no matter how I pitch to him, he says it's wrong. Because I'm not telling people, oh, save a kid or I'm not your piece of shit. You know what I mean? So yeah. it, was, it was tough. Um. You continued in your message. You said that you were expected to hit your bell, hit your goal every day. Otherwise, you get cussed out by Colum if you didn't hit your leadership standards. And you get you specifically said that you would get called out in front of others, other leaders. And you were called a name, which I'm not going to repeat here, but it was um, it's a word that let's just say most females don't like. Yeah. Um, and being asked, you know, what the hell happened? So, what? Why did I'm assuming it's just because you weren't making him enough money, but was there any other reason why you would think Colum would be as verbally abusive as he is described here? Knowing Colum how I know him, he's in the business of messing with people's minds. He's this short little Irish white guy to where anything he says to you, you'll take it as a joke because his tone of voice and everything, and he's smiling the whole time while he's cussing you out. 
And he's like, oh, what the fuck happened? Like, what, you know? And you'd be there like, I don't know, I don't know, you know, like, there wasn't enough people, all this stuff, and he'd tell you, like, those are bullshit excuses. Mm-hmm. And you'd, it, it would make you feel bad, like, what's wrong with me? Why aren't my sales good enough, you know? Yeah. But Colum was the, the, well, the way he was with me, he was usually very, like, he was friendly, he was, he would play with, play around with me, like, I'd be an Atmo, and he'd come and poke me uh play around, things like that. But then when it came to sales or anything, I'd get cussed out smoothly in front of anybody. And it was the way of him getting into my head, like, okay, we're friends, but if you don't make me enough money, like, fuck you, you know? Mm-hmm. That's basically how can I can describe Colm. I mean, I know he was also fed up with Edwin's shit for a good while, but the only reason he didn't let go of Edwin was because he only had two junior executives in the office. And he had to make an example like this is achievable, you know? Right. <laughs> Did you get the, obviously in any of these offices, there's, there's compared to any legitimate business, there's astronomically high turnover. Did you get the sense that your office specifically had a, a large turnover? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so the only people that stuck around in charity was people that had came from Spectrum. Mm -hmm. so spectrum we obviously were taught like the c factors hi how are you who's your current service provider by the way Mm -hmm. you know it was easy to make conversation with people about their cable and internet so we learned sales we learned techniques we learned how to be salesmen and that's when we would move over to charity and when people started off directly on charity they'd be like i can't do this i can't just stop people that i don't know i can't you know, talk to them about this charity that I honestly am not educated about because we weren't educated about them at all. Mm -hmm. They sent us to do this, like, um, this power learn is what they called it online, which is basically giving us the history of what Plan International was, that it started off as a a foster parents act and all these different things back in like 1970 something. And, you know, we'd give that to people, but obviously that's not going to, teach them like okay this is where our funds are going this is how we help people you know these are actual you know cases that we've helped you know kids that are resilient because of us nothing like that so people would drop like flies i'd hire somebody on a monday by wednesday i was hiring two more people because the person that i hired before just didn't last Mm -hmm. and on a personal note you said in your message uh you even used the word brainwashed yeah. Um, that you were brainwashed in in four months of working for this cult. You use that word as well. My happy marriage quickly turned bitter, and I suddenly was going through a rough custody battle as well. Of course, the cult wouldn't understand, and wh- and uh, what I was going through in my personal life, they just tell me to quote unquote safeguard my attitude, which uh, I'm sure is anyone who's worked in this business has had a relationship suffer. I know I did, and that's that's not news to anybody. Um, was that one of the reasons that you? decided to get out of of the cult definitely so um i started the job like beginning of october of last year and i was 18 right so i go in i already before i started the company i had already had my own business which was a tell a travel agent Mm -hmm. i'm a travel agent from home so when i came in i told him i said hey i want something more like hands-on i want to be able to talk to people i want to be able to put my skills to use because i always knew i was good at talking to people you know so they used that and they were like hey you need to see the bigger picture you already have one business let's make you have two three more offices like this is the big picture where you could become a millionaire like think about the life you could give your children like um There's this lady that was, um, that had a big TED talk. Um, I forgot her name was um, Cruz at the end, but um, they're like, yeah, she travels with her children all the time. Her kids are homeschooled just because they can't stay at one school all the time. They, they're always traveling. She's, she's making millions. Her kids have everything. So that's how they got to me. They were like, oh, you know, your kids could have beyond what you've ever thought you could give them. So I'd put in all the hours. I'd be there from seven o'clock in the morning to maybe nine o'clock at night every single day consecutively, every day. 
except Sundays, but there was times where they were like, hey, do you want to hit the field on Sunday? I'd be like, yeah, sure, you know, like, let me train this person some more so that I can move up. It was four months of that, and between it, it was like, oh, you need to be selfish. Your partner's not on this with you, then they don't want the best for you. They're not the person for you. You need to find somebody that's going to be, you know, understanding of your dreams and your hopes and the fact that you want to move up, you know. So there was times where I would tell Cole, I'm like, Hey, uh, there was one time I tried to quit and I told Colm, hey, if I put in my two weeks later on when it's convenient for me, could I come back perhaps? And he told me, he goes, why? And I told him, I said, well, my husband's not willing to keep taking care of the kids all the time because he also works full time. So I think I need to be home a lot more. And he was like, we'll get rid of him. You know, he was like, okay, well, what I can do is I can put you on part time. You could take like a day off during the week, which I mean, a day sure I was here with my kids but it wasn't really making a difference it wasn't making a dent in my relationship you know what I mean yeah and um over time like it was just a lot of that you know selfish mindset mm-hmm. to where my husband and I completely split I left my home because my husband was like hey like you're not here all the time but you come whenever it's convenient for you to sleep shower get dressed and go again so it's not like we're married it's like we're roommates yeah and so I ended up leaving, got my own apartment, everything. Um, I ended up getting divorce papers, you know, um, served to me at the office one morning in front of all of the interviewees, in front of everybody. And Colm's response was, well, what can you do about it from here? You need to safeguard that shit. I was like, oh, okay. You know, and I ended up telling him, I said, you, I made an excuse. I told him, I said, listen, I know I can safeguard it, but I need to be on my shit and I need to find myself a lawyer. So I need to leave. And that's when he was like, okay, you know, find a pro bono one. Obviously he knew I couldn't afford it with the wages I was making. Mm-hmm. You know, when it came to my kids, um, I went through a rough custody battle with them as well, which gladly, you know, thank God, whenever I dropped the job, I was able to work on my marriage, keep my kids, everything. But that wasn't something that as a parent, you can really safeguard I can't be selling these people like, hey, save this kid while I'm losing mine in my personal life. You get what I'm saying? Sure. And Colm never understood it that way. He didn't have kids. He didn't have a partner or anything. He was just more of like, oh, okay, well, take the day off. He's a, he's a cult leader. That's what he yeah. is. He's, he's a cult leader because mm-hmm. what these cults do is isolate you from your support system so that they can mold you in their image. And him just blatantly telling you, get rid of your support system was his most direct way of saying, you know, I'll be your support system and I'll, I'll verbally abuse you and and cuss you out and not care about you, but I'll still be your support system. And, and that's what, that's what all cults do. And uh, it's, it's pathetic that someone like that thinks so highly of himself as a, as a business owner, and supposedly making all this money and, and it has all this power, but regardless of if he does or not, he's still ruining people's lives. And that's, mm-hmm. that's the worst part of all of this. And it doesn't matter if it's for Omni 8 in San Antonio or any of the other offices that we've highlighted on our, on our Facebook page. They are all in the business. They're not in the marketing business. They're in the business of ruining people's lives. And that's why you know, I, I hear from so many people every week. It was terrible. It, it was... I remember two of the people that I hired, it was, it really shook me that we kept telling them the same things. And I noticed that we would take the most vulnerable people and we'd feed them big dreams. Mm -hmm. Um, There was this one lady who, I mean, I'm not going to say any names or anything, but her situation was that she had been um, kicked out of the military because she had bipolar and depression and all of these things. She had lost her daughter. So she came to San Antonio looking for a job, everything. She found us and she was like, oh my God, like this is the business where I can make myself so much to where I can get my child back to where I can, you know, make so much money that because the military didn't leave me with any benefits that it won't even matter. I can make it in this, you know? Mm -hmm. So she tried her best and everything. And it just, it wasn't something that worked, you know? And I felt so bad. I, 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 I wouldn't even train her because I just, I wanted to be real with her and I'd tell her like, get a different job. This Mm -hmm. isn't it. This isn't going to get you anywhere. There was another lady that, um, 
her and her daughter came onto a, uh, our business. She, well, she was Charity, her daughter was Spectrum. Her daughter, I don't know what her, her sales were like, but this lady, she, would, she cried to me one time when I was pitch practicing with her, she just broke down. And I took her outside of the office and I was like, hey, like, I'm here for you, what's going on? She was like, I am so behind on my mortgage. This is ridiculous. She goes, you know, I'm, I'm here every day and I'm trying and I'm, you know, giving it my all to get better, but my bills are still there, you know? And it was to the point where she was scared to get a different job because she had already invested so much time here. She didn't want it to feel like it yeah. all went to waste. Yeah. Second class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll tell you, this has been a seriously heavy and at times depressing conversation, but I want to, I want to finish up on, on kind of a, a somewhat lighter note here. So you, you uh, follow a page on Instagram called Juicy Rhino, correct? Yeah. Now, if, if anyone watching these videos is not checking out Juicy Rhino, uh, please do. Uh, it is a fantastic place for, a, for just a laugh at, at this cult's expense. Uh, the person who runs that Instagram page, I've actually conversed with them a few times. Um, and, but what's interesting about your experience with Juicy Rhino is that you said you got in trouble. So someone in, in your, at Omni 8 found out that you followed that page and you got in trouble for it. But your leader, Edwin, the junior executive, supposedly follows it as well, right? Mm-hmm. And I have the messages I can send you where um, one night I was in my apartment and um, I was there with two other, because I roommate, whenever I split up with my husband, I was a roommate with one of the other guys that worked in the office and I was just there and I was like, hey, are you getting kicked off all the group chats as well? Like, are they making new ones? What's going on? He was like, no, I'm still on them. And literally I was kicked off of like six different group chats because we had, you know, uh, Omni 8, we had the charity squad, we had all these different, you know, group chats. And I was like, what the fuck? (laughs) So I messaged Colm and I was like, hey, why am I getting kicked off the group chats? And he just sent me a screenshot and he goes, I told you not to follow this page, which he hadn't told me. What he did was that he mentioned it on our, on our morning meeting. He was, yeah, there's this like page of rejects that just, you know, <laughs> they just upload these memes because they couldn't make it in the business. And, you know, it's, he goes, they think it's funny, but really it's sad because they couldn't make it. So now they're making fun of us. He never said, don't follow them. You'll get fired if you follow them. None of that. Mm -hmm. And so I went and I followed them just because I wasn't going to have time throughout the day while I was working to look them up, you know, or see the memes or anything. So I followed them. So later on, I could come back and check out the memes, which they're hilarious because it's like all true. Like, (laughs) you know, but um, that night he texted me that and I sent back. A screenshot of it and I circled uh, Edwin's you know username that was following them as well and I said well it was following them as well so what's the issue and he s- never replied back to me he read my message he didn't reply and then I get Edwin you know messaging me and he goes just so you know I always know when you throw me under the bus and I go well are you not following them like am I lying I'm not like it's clear as day it's not fair you know, and he just went on about how me being my age, because I, I, I was 19 at the time, he goes, um, maybe it's because of your age that you always throw people under the bus, blah, 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 but I always know what you're up to. Uh, I've wanted you fired for a long time anyways. And I was like, okay, everybody in the office talks shit about each other. I was like, it doesn't bother me, you know? So that's how I ended up leaving the company because it came down to a stupid, you know, Instagram follow that made them come at me, you know? Yeah. Just think about how ridiculous that sounds. Anyone who's watching this video, (laughs) being reprimanded for following a page on Instagram or on on any, any social medium, it's, it's ridiculous. And, and I'm sure that, I'm sure that Colum got, got mad at you because you called him out on his BS and, um, but that's another very common uh, tactic technique of cults is to tell uh, their subjects to not look at certain pieces of information, whether it's these videos, whether it's the Juicy Rhino Instagram page or whatever it is, 
anything that is critical of that cult is going to be viewed negatively and as as like you said as as failures and and whatever even though those of us that are producing that stuff are probably much better off than than you are Colm, or than you are edwin or anybody else i'll put my pay stub up against yours any day brother and i think anyone else watching these videos will too there was people that would open up offices and it would end up not working out just because they weren't a good enough cult leader it wasn't really about being a you know a manager or any of that it was how are you going to brainwash these people to do what you want mm -hmm. you know yeah. and that's why some of us didn't last because it's like how am i gonna bullshit with people's lives i don't think you know people with any type of morals will do that um for anyone who might encounter one of these people um is there a way that the common person can you know, maybe questions to ask them or things that they can find out if they're legitimate charities or not? <laughs> it's funny because there was times where I would try to pitch somebody and they would, they would throw me a curveball. They'd be like, oh, where were you guys founded at? Where did you start? Where's your office? And each time I got a new question, I, I, I ended up getting a different answer from my superior on what to say next time. But really question them, like get in deep, like, okay, well, you know, how are you getting paid about this? Oh, you volunteered? And that's not it, because you're here every day. How do you make a living? Right. You know, um, you don't volunteer. Uh, how do I know that these kids will reach out to me? How will I know if I receive anything? Am I going to get an email? Are these people going to call me? Any of that. We didn't do any of it. We didn't, you didn't get a call from us within two weeks or a week or you didn't get anything in the mail. You know what I mean? So it's mostly really do your research about it. You had mentioned earlier about getting the, the police got involved. Um, is that, I mean, it seemed to work. Is that a tactic? Like if someone is encounters one of these people and they're kind of unsure if, if they do actually represent the charity or if they are a, a credit code scam, should they put in a call to, to the police? For soliciting, definitely. Ask them for their permit to be there soliciting it's obviously going to drive us away like oh never mind go on about your day right. you know ask for a permit you know the police used to just tell us like you're not supposed to solicit we would show people our web page which wasn't really our web page it didn't go through any of us or anything all it was it was plan international which is a real charity by what i have yeah you know understanding of but we weren't with them you know it we could show you a web page we could make flyers any of that ask for permits if we're really permitted to be there the charity will you know hand out these permits for us to go 